Today we continue on with our Ender 3 series. This one's going to be part 2. If you didn't see the first video in this Ender 3 series, we got it out of the box, we assembled it, we tweaked it just a little bit to make sure everything was operating correctly. I have done a couple prints on this machine, and we should be good to go. Now remember, this series is focused on a new Ender 3 owner's journey through 3D printing, so I don't want to move too quickly. In this video, we're going to go over a few modifications you can make to the printer to make it a little easier to use, and maybe improve the print quality a bit. But I also want to take just a general overview look at the machine. Now this machine I got a few weeks ago compared to my original Ender 3, Creality has already updated a lot of the things that I would have told you to do anyway. So that's good to see. So let's start this video by just taking a look around. And one of the first things I would have suggested that you do is print out some collet clips for your Bowden tube couplers. But Creality has already provided some. They even give you a few extras in the kit. This is really going to help pull up on that coupler and keep it tight on that tube. You definitely don't want these tubes moving around during retraction, especially the one on the hot end side. So it's good to see that these are now included. Even though this is a step in the right direction, in this video we're still going to talk about this tube a little bit more in a minute. Now underneath the hot end, the next thing I would have suggested was to cut off the fiberglass tape that they usually have on their heat blocks and get you a silicone sock. Creality has already included one of those as well. It's great to see that a company is listening to the upgrades that we're making and already including those in the kits. And it is somewhat cool to see the removable plate. It is somewhat flexible so you can remove your parts a lot easier. I have been using a PEI sheet, just a stick down thin sheet on the metal on my other Ender 3 and it's been working great. So maybe later down the road consider putting some PEI on the other side just to give it a try. That way, you have two sides to choose from. To start out though, this mat does stick really well, so we should be good for now. And while we're on the subject of the bed, how about a thermal look just for fun? This is set at 60C. It doesn't look too bad. A little cool around the edges, but that's acceptable. And here it is at 100C. You can definitely, it's got a lot more concentration of heat here in the front than in the back, but for 100C, not too bad. And how about just some quick noise level benchmarks? This is it not printing. And here it is printing with the part fan on. So we got some basic stats and it's good to see that Creality has made some updates to the kit along the way to make it even better. Now the first upgrade that I'm going to look at doing is for the spool holder. If you remember from the first video, I told you not to use the stock spool holder that sets on the top because of the way that it feeds the extruder. It'd be much better if it was setting on the side. Well, a couple of months ago, Chuck Hellebuck released a video where he reworked a part from Thingiverse so that you could mount the spool holder on the side and use a lot less hardware. And that's the upgrade that I'm going to use as well. It uses the stock spool holder and just allows you to mount it on the side of the printer on the aluminum extrusion. So this part allows you to use all the stock hardware and T-nuts that came with the Ender 3. And by the way, here's a look at all the extra hardware that was left over on my Ender 3 after I put it together. On this printed part, we're going to take two of those 5mm T-nuts, and we're going to slot them in these holes. And we're going to attach the stock spool holder to this printed part with the spool open towards the back. We're going to use these button head screws. And with my last 5mm button head screw and T-nut, I'm going to use it in this top hole here to screw it down to the extrusion. And then on the printer, we can pop this end cap off. With the cap off, we can just slide it on. And then we can bring it up pretty close to the Z motor. It's going to feed it kind of towards the back, but it's a lot better than feeding it from the top. And we can tighten up our top screw. And we can put our cap back on. And then our spools will just kind of hang out back here, and it's going to have a lot straighter shot at feeding that extruder. Now let's talk about Bowden tubes for a second. The one that comes stock on the Ender 3, the internal diameter is quite large. And the tighter the tolerance on that tube, the better your retraction is going to be. It's going to make it more efficient. And you can get these Capricorn kits to swap out the tube on Creality printers. It comes with some couplers, a cutter, a piece of tube, and you can get them in both styles of Capricorn. TL and XS. 
The XS tube is the tightest tolerance tube that they offer. I don't recommend starting out with this. And I say that because sometimes when you're starting out 3D printing, you might not be using the highest quality filament, and sometimes the tolerance of the filament can actually be bigger than this tube. I would suggest going with the lighter colored tube, the TL. It's not quite as tight a tolerance as the XS, so it's going to allow for some inconsistent filament. Now going with the Capricorn tube, we're not just after that tighter size tolerance. We also want to use it because of its higher heat tolerance. And on the Creality style 3D printer, that tube goes all the way down to the nozzle. So that's going to help it last longer and prevent jams. Now if you buy the Capricorn kit, you're going to get a couple of additional Bowden couplers, but comparing those to the current iteration of the Ender 3, it's about the same thing. So I'm just going to keep the extra couplers for spares later, but with that kit you also do get a tubing cutter. And these cutters can be really handy. It does help to keep the end of that tube nice and square, especially on the side that you're feeding into the hot end. Now, getting ready to swap that tube out, let's go ahead and preheat for PLA. This will warm the hot end up and melt any plastic that might be on the end of the tube to keep you from pulling it out. While we're preheating, let's go ahead and cut these zip ties that's holding the wires on the tube. Be careful. We can pull our collet clips. We can push down on the coupler on the extruder side and pull the tube out. Once we're preheated, we'll push down on this coupler and we'll pull this side of the tube out. And just to show you these tubes, you can see how much of a difference there is in between internal diameter on the stock tube versus Capricorn. And when we cut the tube, we'll start with one side and make sure it's really flush. We'll just cut the end off to make sure we start with something that's nice and square. I suggest you actually push and spin a bit. That helps eliminate any wobble in the blade so it gets it nice and flat. And then on an Ender 3 for the stock setup, I found about 40 centimeters is a good number for the length of tube. So we'll cut it right about there. Still preheated, we can go ahead and put it on the extruder side, put our clip back on. Then we can force it down into the hot end. Push it down as far as it'll go. You might kick a little bit of filament out, but that's a good thing. We can go ahead and put our collet clip on the hot end side. Now there's a couple of different tricks out there to keep this tube from backing up at all. I've seen people split the tube, so there's two pieces, but let me show you the way that I like to handle it. So we're still preheated, it's going to be hot, but we're going to get some pliers and pull off our silicone sock. Just be careful that you don't grab any of the thermistor or heater wires. I'm going to take my 6mm socket and put it on the nozzle, and I'm going to back it out one turn. I put a line on the socket so I know how far I've turned it. There we go. Now up here at our coupler, I'm going to go ahead and push that tube down so that I fill that gap that I made with that one turn from the nozzle. Push it down a couple times, make sure it's in there nice and snug. These couplers are actually two-way couplers, so for it to bite on this tube, it actually has to come up just a little bit. Well, that's what we're doing here. When we tighten this nozzle up now, it should press up on the tube and tighten this tube up nice and firm in that coupler. So we'll go ahead and tighten our nozzle back up. You can use a torque wrench if you have one, but just don't get it crazy tight and you should be okay. And there we go. Now that tube shouldn't be going anywhere and you won't have any jams. When you're all done, you can put your sock back on. Replace a couple of the zip ties on the wires. Don't get them very tight. You don't want to risk pinching that tube. And we should be in good shape. And in my opinion, swapping out that tube and going through that nozzle tightening procedure is probably one of the best things you can do for any Creality machine. Now our next upgrade is one that's always kind of bothered me on the Ender 3. And that's the space that's open underneath the LCD screen when you're trying to use the control knob. And you see what I'm talking about right here. Anytime you come in and try to use that knob, almost always you're touching some sort of solder joint on the bottom of this PCB. Fortunately, there are a ton of great covers that can go on the bottom of that, so it's much more friendly to use. So this will actually just screw on the bottom using the stock screws. So we can take these two screws in the front here loose. That'll let us remove our screen. We can flip it over. We can take the ribbon cable off for now. We can take these four screws loose. They're threaded into the metal cover. We don't even have to take the screen off fully. This cover will just slide down over the speaker and the ribbon cable connections, just like this. And then you can just put the stock screws right back on. Covers installed, looks much cleaner. 
our ribbon cable can go back on. Then we can put our screws back in and reattach our screen. And it's all done. That is so much better when you're using it, you don't touch that PCB anymore. Next up, a part that's really simple but can be really useful. The wires that support the hot end carriage, the heater, the thermistor, the fans, they tend to be really long on the Ender 3, and that loom can interfere with the Y carriage movement. So a simple bracket to zip tie that wire to to get them out of the way is really handy. So here's the bracket we're going to use. It has a couple of holes for zip ties so you can attach that wire loom, and a hole down here, it'll be sandwiched in between the screw that holds the extruder arm on, this one right here. So we'll just take out that screw, we'll set our bracket on right there, and put that screw back in. Easy enough, make sure the hot end carriage is all the way to the right so we have enough wire to support that movement. Leave just a little bit of slack and then you can slide your wires in that bracket. Run some zip ties through the holes. And it's done. Now those wires are out of the way and it won't interfere with any of the movements. And for the last upgrade today, we're going to add some LED lights. Of course, adding lights to things always makes it cooler, but in this case, it's going to be functional as well. Just by getting a little more light on your build area, it's going to make it so much easier for you to see what the printer's doing and resolve issues if you have any. And for a new 3D printing user, this can be really valuable. I can't tell you how many times over the years, just by getting a little more light in there, made it so much easier to resolve an issue. And this is really easy to do, and it's affordable, so I'm not sure why you wouldn't want to add some. Now the Ender 3 is a 24 volt system, and we're going to power these directly so they're always on. So I'm using some cheap 24 volt LEDs, they're on an adhesive strip, and you can cut them to fit whatever size you need. I got a couple of pieces of 24 gauge wire, I just grabbed a meter of each just to be safe. I got these parts I found on Thingiverse, these just slide into the top gantry, and they'll hold your LED tape. You can print them on their end so they don't need any supports, and you don't even have to remove any screws to install them. A really nice design. I also printed out a piece of channel cover so we can cover up the wires when we run them. This fits in the groove in the extrusion. And I modeled up this end cap piece we can put on so we have a hole to run the wires to the back of the printer. So the holder bar is going to slide in that extrusion. The LEDs are going to fit down here like this. And on this LED strip, you need exactly three sections. And what I mean by section, they give you a spot where you can cut every so many LEDs. So one, two, three. So we'll cut it right here. We'll strip just a bit of the insulation off the ends of our wires, and we're going to solder them on these copper pads right here, positive and negative. Just like that, be careful you don't want to use too much heat, but it's pretty easy to do. Then we can pop off the extrusion end cap right here. Then we can slide in our LED holders. They'll fit right in the slots of the extrusion. Just like so, they fit really nice. No need to even glue them together or anything like that. You could do them on the front, the back, or you could do both if you really wanted to. Then we'll move the backing from the adhesive LED strip. And then the end where you soldered the wires are going to go on the side with the power supply, the right side. Then we can just start the strip on one holder, press it down in the channel, and the strip will help connect the other holder. Then I made this end cap that we can slide on. The wires will run through it just like that. And it'll go right into the extrusion, just like so. And then you can just feed your wires down into this outside channel here. And we can use this printed channel cover to keep them in. These just snap into the slots, like so. It probably wouldn't hurt to print out a couple of these. You could run them all the way down the extrusion and still put the power supply on and you'd be fine. We'll remove this screw down here, this screw up here. That gives us access to our power supply. Then we can remove the screws for the cover on the power supply. You can just slide it off. You don't have to remove it fully. We just need access to these terminals here. Just be careful. You don't want to unhook anything. And for those of you that don't know, these three terminals over here are your mains voltage, the positive line, the neutral, and the ground. These three are your negative 24 volts. These three are positive 24 volts. So we're just going to run our LED wires into the bottom of the cover, same as the input voltage wires. We'll strip the ends of these just a bit, and I'm going to use a crimp on spade connector to connect these to these terminals. Please don't just use bare wire in these terminals. You need some sort of connector on it to make sure it's a good connection. Connectors are on. We can flip up this cover. We'll put our positive wire over here on this terminal and our negative wire right here on this terminal. We should be good. We can put our cover back on. Covers on. We can put it back on the printer. Just mind your wires. You don't want to get them pinched. 
So we can go ahead and screw the power supply back on. Now every time you turn your printer on, let there be light. After you've had these lights on your printer for a while, you won't know what you ever did without them. Trust me. And that's going to bring us to the end of part two on our Ender 3 journey. Again, I want to start this series pretty slowly because you don't want to make a whole lot of changes to your printer all at the same time. If you do, it's going to be really hard to diagnose an issue if you see one. A huge thank you to all the community members that submit their models on sites like Thingiverse, My Mini Factory, Prusaprinters.org. Without those models, these modifications would be really hard to make. All the information to the parts that I used and the creators in the description below. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribing to my channel. If not, leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Now it's time to do some prints and test out our mods.